Alright guys, got a little bit of a different video for you today. Uh, we're going to be working on the 59 Chevy Bel Air. Uh, and this video is going to be about how to diagnose a non-functioning speedometer. Um, this seems to be a relatively common problem on vehicles uh, of this age. Um, I believe uh, it's a very similar process on a lot of Chevys at least. Um, from I think like 1947 all the way up into the 70s. Um, there'll be some variance with some of the parts you're working with, but as far as the actual way that the cable works and interacts with the Speedo, it should be very similar. So this is probably going to be pretty helpful for you along the way. So my Speedo stopped working recently, um, which has kind of forced my hand on doing this. Um, a little bit before it failed, it started making a clicking sound, and uh, from what I understand, that's a relatively common symptom that kind of indicates that it's time to do some work. Uh, my suggestion would be, uh, don't be like me. <laughs> if you hear the clicking sound, do some preventative maintenance. Don't wait till it actually fails, uh, because it's kind of annoying. So um, the right thing to do is obviously fix this as quickly as possible, because not only is it helpful to know how fast you're going, not that I drive that fast in the 59 anyway, uh, but also it stops your odometer from working, so you're not really reflecting true mileage on the vehicle. So... Um, First thing I did was rush out and buy a new Speedo cable. And then I kind of paused and realized, you know what, I need to actually check all the different components in the system because it may not just be the cable. Um, sometimes it is as simple as just lubricating the, the original cable. Um, you know, other times it's a little more involved than that. So uh, today we're going to actually take the speedometer off and I'm going to kind of inspect the Speedo head and see if it's actually, um, you know, functioning properly or if it's maybe binding in the actual speedometer itself. Uh, and then we're going to work our way down from there through the cable, etc. If that's not what it is. Einstein really wants to help, but unfortunately he doesn't have thumbs. Man, I love this car. Alright. So, here's the culprit. And uh, I'm going to show you how to take it off, at least for this vehicle. Again, this will probably vary uh, depending on which vehicle you have, because obviously every dashboard is a little different. Um, but real straightforward on, uh, on a 59 at least. So in my case, um, I have these two screws right here. So just a Phillips head screw. And you can see that there's basically kind of like a rubber gasket that runs around the uh, assembly here. And uh, there may be some, um, some attachment up here that I need to dig into, but the first thing I'm going to do is remove those two screws and see if that frees this thing up. And of course I have my super cool moon tack, which I absolutely adore, um, right in the way of this screw. But thankfully I have a little contraption that will let me get to that, and uh, you know, that should make it a little bit easier to work on. Alright, one... And two. And for those of you saying I'm being lazy in the comments and that I should have removed the tack, you are absolutely right. So I removed those bottom screws and as predicted, there is something else holding it on. So it looks like we got to go under the dash. I thought this was pretty cool. This was the car's last service before I got a hold of it. And it looks like, or at least the last uh, documented one. So looks like 10-7 uh, of 1970. But the car was on the road in 1972. Maybe that's why the poor thing blew up and got parked. I've spent more time under here than I'd care to admit. So the last thing holding the Speedo in is one nut. It's basically top dead center and it is uh, 5 sixteenths. So you can see here I've got my 5 sixteenths wrench that I used and it worked perfectly. And now She's free. So while I was under there, um, I disconnected the speedometer cable itself. It's very straightforward. Um, you'll basically see a threaded outer collar that you can unscrew from the back of the speedometer. Um, and then basically you can just kind of pull it back away. Uh, the inside of the speedo cable, the actual cable itself, uh, has like basically a square peg that just slides into the back. Um, so I've pulled that away. So that's now disconnected. Uh, there's also bulbs in the Speedo, which just basically clip in. Uh, I'm going to take a crack at removing those from outside, as, assuming there's enough slack in the cables themselves to get them out. Uh, it's just a little bit tight under the dash, and I don't want to cut myself on something under there. Um, but if I can't, then I'll go back underneath, and uh, I'll try and disconnect the bulbs from underneath. So this just lifts up and out, kind of like that. There we go. And she's free. So I'm going to experiment with these cables. 
Uh, definitely gonna be very careful not to like yank on them because they are older, so I'm gonna just uh, use both hands for this part. And for reassembly reference, on the left side of the Speedo, you have a gray on top and a light blue on the bottom. On the right side, you have gray on top again and you have a darker blue on the bottom. And top dead center, you have a bright green, which I believe is the indicator that the high beams are on. It lights up the little Chevy bow tie that you can see right there. Kind of a neat little feature. And there she is, in all her glory. So, uh, to get the bulbs out, um, you can just wiggle them out with your fingers, to be honest, but um, because they are, I think, pretty old bulbs, and they do still work, um, I basically just got them started and then took a little flat blade screwdriver and got it between the uh, the housing and the um, of the bulb and the back of the speedo and just very carefully uh, pried it away just so I didn't risk like you know banging the bulb on the side of the housing uh, and breaking it. Uh, so we're gonna basically dig into this and see about getting it apart. Looks like we just have flat blade screws on three different locations holding the back on, kind of two at the bottom and one offset here at the top, and that looks like it'll free the back here from the uh, kind of trim around the outside. Uh, and conveniently, looks like someone's worked on this before, unless they just did this from the factory, because blue, gray, green, gray, light blue. And that was already written on there, that was not me. And to show you what I was talking about with the actual Speedo cable itself, that's where it threads on, and in the center there is where it inserts, but we'll get you a better shot of that once we have some light on this thing. And like I always say, while you're in there, clean what you can't reach once you put it back together. This thing's gonna get a nice little cleanup. All right, so, got her in the workshop. Um, so I'm gonna flip this over, I'm gonna put something down on the workbench, uh, something soft just so I don't scuff the uh, leading edge of the bezel here. And uh, we're gonna work on separating the uh, functional assembly from the decorative bits out here. So like I showed you briefly in the car, this is the hardware we're working on removing. And as predicted, this looks pretty rusty, uh, which is interesting. Actually, a lot of the stuff under the dash is in great shape, but the, um, you know, some little bits of hardware here and there just seemed a little prone to rust. So the good news is uh, they are both flat blade and also hex. So worst case, I could probably get a wrench on them. Uh, I'm gonna be real careful trying them at first. And if it seems like it's giving me too much resistance, I'll probably hit these with some PB Blaster and kind of let that do its work. So, uh, we'll see how that goes. And I should note that I heard something interesting and a little bit worrying when I moved this. Let me see if you guys can hear it. I don't know if you guys caught that, but... I'm hoping it's maybe just a little bit of broken glass or something from an old bulb in there. Um, rather than something that's part of the inner workings. <laughs> so, it sounded dainty, so I'm hoping it's glass and not metal, but we'll see. Good news! So these are actually turning nice and freely, but one thing I should point out. Um, I've ended up using a significantly larger screwdriver uh, with a much thicker blade. Um, this is probably a no-brainer to some of you guys that have worked on stuff like this before, but if you're newer to car stuff, especially with a flat blade, um, if your flat blade is loose inside of the slot there, you should definitely work up to a larger one until it feels snug. Um, that little bit of play is what often leads to the flat blade jumping out. So even though these are teeny tiny screws and I'm using this giant screwdriver, you see how it seats in there real nice. And that's just a good way to prevent from essentially stripping out a flat blade screw. But as you can see, it just turns nice and smooth. And again, it fits in there perfectly. So just a consideration if you're working with flat blades, especially on older cars, there are a lot of these flat blade screws. All right, so we got it removed from the outer housing. So I can basically take this and, uh, and put it away on a nice soft stool. There we go. So um, this is the full assembly of the speedometer itself. Um, and basically, um, it looks like this trim is just kind of pinched on. So you see how you got those little uh, areas there where it's kind of bent inward. So I'm going to very gently, carefully pry those up um, so that the outer bezel here frees up. 
and you can get replacement ones of these but i would really love to keep the original one because then all of the gauges will match because as you can see they show some age so if i have one bright new speedo uh, lens it'll make like the fuel gauge and the uh, oil and um, uh, charging lights lenses look crappy so uh, i'm gonna work on getting this bezel off uh, and then we will look at what's inside of this thing so some potentially good news while i was fiddling around with the bezel and moving the thing around this little stuff fell out which is broken glass from an old bulb so i'm really hoping that that's just what the little noise inside was uh which you know it's a bit of a relief <laughs> so i uh, just figured to give you an update but back to farting around with these annoying little clips all right we have success uh, that was a little freaky, to be honest, but um, these things are a little more robust than I expected, so it just took a little more force than I intended to originally put on things. Um, what I ended up doing was basically, um, right at the bottom here, I was able to get a screwdriver just next to this area, and um, basically I was able to kind of tuck it in and just pry, keeping constant pressure on one little corner, and then I worked my way around with another screwdriver, and as I kind of put it in behind each of those bent tabs and twisted, it was able to hop each one over the edge. And by the time I had done two additional ones, the whole assembly came free. Uh, it definitely appears that someone has been in here before. You can just see some marring and stuff like that. Um, so, but again, whole car's not perfect. I Hindsight probably could have got some paint and taken this opportunity to refinish this thing. But uh, admittedly, I just want to get the thing working. So now I know my way around it. It's uh, probably a little quicker to get it in and out. Interesting thing, um, now I know why these things light up that cool teal color, and it's because of the paint on the inside of this uh, assembly. I was always wondering how they did that, because the bulbs just look like regular amber bulbs, and at first I thought maybe it was a tinted lens, but as you can see, that is just a clear lens. Uh, but again, you have this teal paint here, and uh, that appears to be what creates the color. So, kind of neat, huh? So after clearing out the last little bits of broken glass from in there, uh, which does confirm my suspicion that those bulbs are relatively easy to break, thus my method of prying them out is probably a good idea. The only last piece of hardware that I see are going to be these two screws. So my guess would be once I undo these two screws, that will release the face uh, from the kind of outer cup here. So I'm going to do that real quick, and uh, hopefully this will be in uh, another two pieces. Another success. So, uh, upon removing those screws, it does have these little rubber feet as well. So I just popped those out, and it was still all stuck together. And I, because I was, you know, well, there's no other hardware holding it together, so it's probably just a little bit of an interference fit going on. So I basically just, with the assembly this way up, and this little tail sticking out through the hole there, kind of pointing down, I just gently tapped the whole assembly on the workbench, and that kind of popped the center out. Um, I actually got a little lucky. Um, I hadn't paid attention to how these things were stacked, but basically these assemblies stayed kind of right where they were. So it looks like you have this outer ring here, you have this literal cardboard looking one here, and then you have this black disc, and it looks like that just kind of sits on the end. Um, they don't appear to be adhered in any way, um, so I'm not 100% certain exactly how all of this functions, but I know that if you uh, remember from earlier, that uh, you've got your light blue, your dark blue, and your green uh, bulb um, entrances there. So I'm guessing these are like the hoods that stop it from lighting up parts of the, uh, the gauge cluster that's not supposed to. And you have a hole there and a hole there, which will be, I think, your main, uh, main illumination lights. And man, am I resisting the urge to paint that a different shade of green and see if I can get the thing to light up green like the rest of the car. How cool would that be? But I'm gonna keep it original, keep it that cool teal color. And I don't really understand if that's a special type of paint or not, so we're going to not fuss with it. And here we have the main assembly. Um, so upon initial inspection, looks pretty complete. I don't see any, like, busted teeth on any of these gears or anything like that. Uh, but I'm going to do a deeper inspection. And I'm basically going to try and just turn a few of these elements uh, real carefully. But that is the worm gear right there that appears to drive this whole assembly. Um, from your main input here. So uh, I'm going to just do a little bit of poking around and exploring, and uh, hopefully I can get this thing to actually move. And then if I can, I might even try attaching the speedo cable to it and put a drill to it 
Um, which important fact, by the way, if you're testing one of these and you put a speedo cable to it uh, and then connected power drill to the other end, make sure that the drill is spinning in reverse. You do not want it spinning clockwise. Um, so yeah, I'm going to just uh, do some digging and see if we can't uh, test this assembly out and maybe find what's binding. All right, so after carefully fiddling with uh, some of the gears, uh, my hope was that I could just put my finger on this worm gear here and turn it that way. Um, but it's not moving, and I feel like there might be some binding happening somewhere in here. Um, so to test that, conveniently, I have this Speedo cable, uh, but obviously you could always pull the one out of the car or find another way to drive this. Um, but essentially, I'm going to use the far end of the Speedo cable here, and as you can see, when I try to turn this counterclockwise, it does not move. You can see it's resisting me, and, um, you know, basically this is kind of like a... A pretty stiff wire in here so it's it's not wanting to budge and you can see that I'm turning it right now and I mean it is just not responding at all and I made sure that I don't have this uh, too tight or anything like that I mean it should for all intents and purposes be working um, so that leads me to believe that I've got something going on inside of this assembly so we're gonna basically take this off uh, which is the two flat blade screws right here and uh, I'm going to kind of dig around in there. I believe there's a couple more screws on the underside here. Uh, and I'm going to be very careful because I have no idea what the inside of this looks like. So, um, yeah, we're going to just kind of delve in and hopefully it doesn't all just spring apart into an unrecognizable mess. So this is why you always go slowly and carefully when you're venturing into unknown territory. Uh, so I removed these and just very carefully started to lift and see what was going on because I knew that this uh, worm gear was probably going to slide out of this housing. Um, I didn't think about the fact that this is the drive for the needle itself. And um, as you can see, it runs through there. So you can see as I lift this, that starts to come with it. And the problem is, that is attached to the needle, right? So, um, I don't 100% know how to pop the needle off. So I had a brainwave, and I'm going to undo these two screws on here, and that should leave this cup piece relatively in place, so I can at least take a look inside by just removing this outer piece. So that's going to be the approach I take. Uh, if that doesn't seem like it's going to work, then I may move on to trying to figure out how to actually remove the needle. It's twice on this one project that this little guy has come in handy. If you don't have one of these, I'd highly suggest it, because it lets you get into tight spaces like that, and uh, you can put any fitting you want in there. It's like a bit driver, but it's just like a mini ratcheting wrench. When you have a nice suite of the fittings like this, it gives you a lot of options. So this thing is uh, definitely already paid for itself, because I think I got it for like three bucks or something at one of the uh, vendor booths out at the Street Rod Nationals. So much for that idea. So I put it all back together, but unfortunately, when you remove these screws, this cup does drop down, but the internals don't. And there's actually a tiny little coil spring, um, which basically is like the return spring for the needle. And that's attached on one end to this cup and on the other end to this assembly. So you gotta be real careful actually, um, because uh, you know coil springs are supposed to work kind of in a flat plane. And uh, when I started to drop this down, I started to see that it was kind of pulling it um, downward rather than uh, the way it's supposed to go, which is rotationally. So uh, let's not do that. So I'm going to actually pop this uh, rubber gasket off here. And um, hopefully, I don't think there's really anything magical underneath this, but um, we may be looking at having to pop that needle off. So yeah, it doesn't appear like there's any... Uh, voodoo behind that so uh all right well i'm going to do some research on how to safely remove that needle and more importantly how to reattach it uh once we're done and then we'll work on pulling this thing out small breakthrough um i think we may be in good luck that it's not fully bound up and let me show you what i'm talking about here so i had the brainwave after showing you guys my neat little driver set and i remembered i have with these uh, square bits, which are often used for like the um, the screws that you'd see on the side of like a trailer or something like that. And I tested one, and this one, conveniently, was basically the right size for the drive for the uh, Speedo here. 
So I just, you know, it allowed me to get a little extra leverage on this thing. And basically when I put this in like that, I just gently turned it, but it gave me just that little bit enough to see that actually it does rotate. And when I did that, I also noticed that this whole collar rotates. It's not just inside. So now I have it to where the collar rotates, but you can see right about there, it binds. So the good news is the assembly does turn and I did actually flip this over and I tested it when I turned that, you know, with a decent amount of speed and I go from like just after it's binding to just where it binds, it does tick the needle. So it does function still, but I need to figure out what inside of here is binding, but I'm guessing it may just need lubrication and I'm hoping that's maybe a service thing that I can do without having to take all this apart. So I'm going to do a little bit of research and see about lubricating this and, um, if that's the case, that could be a godsend because literally I think the factory cable might still be okay and uh, we can just lubricate this and put it all back together and we may have a functioning speedo. Complete sidebar, but I just made a little discovery that I feel kind of stupid about and this makes a lot of sense. These little discs, which I thought were just like black plastic because they're sitting on a dark tube there, when I picked it up I realized, oh wait a minute, that's green glass. So that is obviously the colored lens for the turn signal. So that makes a lot of sense. And also, desperately needs a clean. So I'm hoping, just a, a delicate cleaning on that to get some of the crud off of it, I might get a slightly more vibrant uh, turn signal light as well. So anyway, I thought that was neat. So uh, I guess you got different colored lenses here, uh, probably for the high beams and then the turn signals. So there you go. We have a solution and it's pretty easy. So when I took off this uh, gasket and I kind of looked around this area, I was like, eh, it doesn't look like anything here, but I should have known this little nub here was there for a reason. And if you look closer, you can see this teeny tiny little plug in the end here, almost like a freeze plug that you'd see in your engine. So basically uh, that is the port you would use to lubricate this thing. Now getting it out is tricky. <laughs> um, I don't have necessarily tweezers or pliers that are going to be able to get enough of a grip on that to pull them out. So I did find a method that I'm going to try um, that is basically, you know, a little more uh, brutal, but also delicate enough to not damage the, uh, the Speedo. So essentially what we're going to be doing, and I'll see if I can do this without getting completely in your way, is taking a drill bit, but not necessarily attaching it to a drill, and by hand, just very carefully drilling a teeny tiny hole right in the middle of this plug. So essentially, you know, I'm gonna to have to use both hands so I can keep some pressure on this, but even just me doing this is actually eating away at the material. So it is very soft. Um, a lot of these are brass from what I understand. So um, I'm basically gonna work my way through here. And once we have a hole, I'm gonna show you what the next step is. Well, that all happened quite quickly. Uh, as soon as this bit through, uh, it hit the felt behind it, which let me see if you can see in there. So that is kind of like a felt wick in there, and that's what takes the lubricant. And as soon as the, the drill bit hit that, basically the plug popped out following the, uh, the corkscrew on the bit. So um, I'm gonna just put that off to the side for now. But essentially, we need to lubricate inside of there. Now, just in case yours doesn't pop out as easily as mine, the method I read said that basically you would create that hole and then take a small screw um, and kind of thread it into the hole uh, and that would give you a lever that you could kind of wiggle it out with. Um, so if yours doesn't pop out like mine did, you could basically just take um, a screw of the right size. So make sure your drill bit matches a screw that you have laying around um, and just carefully thread it in there. And once it's threaded, you should be able to pull it out and maybe with an ever so slight wiggle, pop the plug out. So if yours doesn't pop out like mine, that's the method to use. So next up is going to be trying to actually pull the felt itself out of here. And it sounds like we can kind of grab into it with the drill, like so. And then pull the thing out. So I'm going to work on this, but uh, I might need to use the same method where I have some force on the back and just kind of screw into it and then pop the thing out. All right. Well, that worked pretty easy. Um, exactly what it sounds like. You basically just kind of push in with the, the drill bit and... Um, you know, when you have some good force, you don't actually have to rotate it too much. You just kind of want to let it bite into it. And then I actually just pitched it at a slight angle and slid it out. So now that it's this far out, uh, I'm probably just going to use some needle nose here. 
and pull it the rest of the way out. So this is our wick uh, that's actually going to contain some of the um, the lubricant and kind of store it, so it maintains lubrication. Of course, my camera won't focus on it. There we go. Uh, but to start with, we're actually going to put a little bit of lube directly in there. So the recommendation I came across was to use a very light uh, oil. Uh, in this case, I'm going to be using uh, white mineral oil, which is usually used for sewing machines and things like that. Um, you know, this is something common if you have a sewing machine, I'm sure you have some of this, but it's also easy to find if you don't and pretty cost effective. So, um, you know, I think it's going to be a good option for this. Um, you know, it happens that the, the shop that I work at, actually, we run embroidery machines. So we have tons of this stuff. Uh, but again, anyone with a household sewing machine, it probably actually came with a small tube of this or something very similar. I do apologize if some of this footage is a little shaky. I am holding the camera with my left hand so that I can be a little more deft with my right hand. So uh, this is the needle for the lube bottle here. And essentially, I'm just going to make sure that goes down in the hole like that. And I'm going to put just a few drops in here. So, one. All right, that's probably good, actually. Um, and the idea there is that that lets it get directly inside of the, uh, the unit, rather than relying on the wick to supply it more slowly. And then, basically, we just work the thing around a little here, just to let that lubricant get distributed. So I'm going to fiddle with this, I'm going to change the angle of the speedo, kind of tip it downward, upward, and just continue to spin this, um, just to try and let it move up and down the shaft and everything like that. And we have a breakthrough. I think I know exactly what's going on now. Uh, so yes, the speedometer definitely did need lubrication, but that's actually not what the issue was. Um, it has a bit more of a mechanical issue, and I'm still digging into exactly how to resolve it, but let me show you what we're working with. So while I was spinning the input shaft here to work the lubricant up and down, um, Basically, I noticed that every handful of rotations, I would start to get the binding again, and it wasn't as bad, but it definitely was was noticeable. And I'm, I was racking my brain trying to figure out, okay, why why the heck would it be doing that? So I figured, all right, you know what? Let's lubricate some of the other components, right? So in here, um, underneath, you see this little plastic shaft right by my thumb there. Um, so that's one end of an angled drive piece, basically, that follows along here. And then that's the other end of it right there, right? So it draws a diagonal between there and there. And that is spinning, um, you know, basically uh, perpendicular to this. Then here is the uh, vertical, which you can see is the worm gear all the way to the back there, right? So that worm gear, right, then turns the little guy there, which turns this, which turns this, which turns this, which turns your odometer. Which, by the way, um, don't touch your odometer or any of the numbers or anything on the dial. While I don't think mine has this issue, uh, some of the, uh, the paint on some of these can get perished, and you'd hate to you know, smear one or something like that, because from what I understand, you're kind of screwed if you do. It's really, really difficult to replace other than like physically replacing the entire components rather than you, know, you can't really just repaint it. So anyway, sidetracked. What I discovered was every certain number of rotations here I was hearing a little click and it was the worm gear skipping on the little gear there so I checked the little gear and I checked its two big brothers right next to it and none of those appear to be binding right these seem to move pretty freely here there's really nothing that should stop those from rotating so what it is is something in this uh, odometer drum here and you can see that this shaft is pretty rusty. Um, so I think I just need to figure out how to get these things turning again. So I've removed the two screws that pin the shaft in place here. And uh, basically, I'm going to probably pop this entire drum out uh, very, very carefully because I have no idea how it's all held together, etc. Um, and I really don't want this thing to all come flying apart. So um, I think if we kind of start under here and just, yeah, okay, so I can lift that up like that, and I'll probably do the same on this side, but I'm definitely going to make sure I have both hands available to do that, um, and hopefully I'll find that maybe there's just some binding going on, maybe this main, um, you know, uh, one mile or single digit mile number is binding on the shaft or something like that, not 100% sure, so 
uh, we're going to dive in and figure this out, but this is definitely our culprit here. And uh, no, I'm not going to change my mileage. You guys already saw what it was. I'll make sure it's the same when it goes back. And besides, you guys have seen my paint. No one would believe me anyway. So I've removed the drum that has the odometer on it. Uh, but before I fiddle with that, I realized I should probably close this up. So I'm going to put the uh, felt wick back in there, uh, which is real straightforward. Um, and I am going to add a little bit of the lubricant uh, to that as well. And then once that's in... Uh, I'm basically going to mix up this little two-part epoxy I have going on here, which is just JB Quick. I'm going to stir those together and basically use that to fill in the little plug here. Uh, and then once that's filled in, I'm going to press that back in place uh, just to reseal this whole thing. I figured I should probably knock that out now. That way the, uh, the JB can be drying and, um, you know, it's one less thing to worry about. All right, so I mixed up the 50-50 on the uh, JB weld, and I've settled some of that inside of this. Um, I actually just used one of the little orange pick tools from uh, Harbor Freight, I guess, just to kind of like poke some in there, you know, kind of, and then it sort of self-leveled. It actually looks pretty professional, you know, if I do say so myself. Um, I poked the felt wick back in there, and I put about three drops of that um, white mineral oil on the felt as well, so that should stay lubricated nicely as well. And while it was all apart, I did test by rotating the assembly, right? And the clicking that was happening when the uh, the worm gear was jumping the tooth on the um, uh, the next gear right there, that has now stopped. So um, again, I've got white mineral oil on all of these and it is just butter smooth, which is great. So that confirms exactly what I was thinking, which is that there's some binding happening in here. Uh, so I now need to do some experimentation and see how this all works. All right, so I've lubricated the odometer. Um, I kind of found a way of doing it without having to disassemble the whole shaft. Uh, unlike some of the newer style ones where there's more of like a circlip holding it all together, it appears that this has more of like a pressed on fitting and I didn't really want to get into kind of prying that off. Um, in the metal tabs that go between each of the drums on the odometer, there is a little groove on the, I guess it would be the front side if you're facing it from inside the car. Um, so I got some lubricant in between the drums that way. I was able to work them back and forth and actually felt like I did free them up quite a lot. Um, the challenge is, even with all of that, as soon as I add that last gear back into the system, uh, it gets right back to that warm gear jumping off of the teeth of the first gear. So um, no matter how free I get that, that seems to be just that last little bit of extra load that it can't handle. Um, it's leading me to believe that perhaps the end of the warm gear shaft, uh, the warm gear itself that's jumping, um, that is at the back of the speedometer face is allowing for some flex that it's not supposed to be. Uh, so I'm going to kind of fiddle with that and see if perhaps maybe that end of that is broken. Um, so I'm hoping that's not the case. I don't know if I can actually get that part or not, uh, but I'm going to do some digging and I think that might be the next step on my, my specific speedo. All right, so because I used the JB Quick, this actually sets quite quickly. Uh, so this is pretty much ready to go. Um, again, I just basically used the, uh, the epoxy in there to seal this off, just so none of the, uh, the oil that I put in the Speedo leaks out. So I'm now going to basically just push this back into the hole that it came out of to seal it back up. So I got it started just using my fingertip there, and then to press it in, I'm just going to use the flat of this flat blade screwdriver. And as you can probably tell, it does not take much force at all to get that pressed back in nicely. So I'm going to give it once more, uh, just with both arms, that way I can make sure it's as seated as it will possibly get, but then we're done. Alright, as you can see I was able to get it near flush, just how it was when I took it out in the first place, and it looks nice, it's a kind of tidy and almost factory looking job there. Alright, so this is our culprit, this is the worm gear that's giving me all this hassle, and um, it's interesting, basically it's these teeth that are jumping on this little gear that's right inside here. And um, I was able to remove this without having to pull the needle off by simply lifting this assembly and playing with the little bit of flex that was given there. And I was able to actually drop this guy, which normally sits roughly here. Uh, when I lifted it, it was able to let me uh, get the bottom pin out and I was able to drop this out. Now that I'm examining it, it doesn't seem ridiculously worn. I mean, there's a little bit of a taper going on at the bottom there. But um, it made me second guess that this was the culprit. So I started fiddling with this assembly a little bit more. Turn this guy around here. 
and I realized when I try to turn this, it is just binding. Like, it'll turn the wrong way, but when I try and turn it the right way, it just says no. So I'm going to take this odometer assembly back out, and I'm going to give this another go at trying to rotate just this gear um, while leaving all of this pinned in place. Again, you see these pins, or I, I guess these tabs, I should say, lock against this bar. So I'm going to see what I can do as far as getting this thing to turn, because there's something in this that's binding. I really thought this was going to be a quick project, but hey, you guys are learning everything about these speedometers with me, so hopefully this is helpful to people that need that really in-depth guide. And if you have a little problem, most likely I've probably already addressed how to do it along the way. All right, we have a breakthrough. So what I did, uh, I ended up holding this shaft here, and I turned the gear, but this time, rather than just working it back and forth, which I realized was kind of stupid, um, I turned the gear consistently in one direction over and over again, just like it would actually operate. And um, once I did that, I found that every time one of these drums went to engage another, i.e. every uh, 10 steps on or 9 steps on this one, it should engage this one for one step, right? Every time I did that, it would hit a binding spot right where it tried to carry the next one over. So the internal assembly there, where it tries to hook the next, uh, or engage the next drum, that's where the binding was happening. So I turned it over quite a few times. And as you can see, this is actually the mileage that would read out now on the odometer. So I had like 89,000 something, blah, blah, blah. I turned it enough times to get it to 50,487, right? So, um, now, <laughs> I essentially need to um, undo that and put it back to the proper 89473 or whatever it was. I'll look back in the earlier videos to try and get it proper. So I'm now going to turn it the other way, which will continue to help the case of, you know, again, unbinding these things. Um, and I'm hoping that'll start to have worked enough oil through this to where it'll f like properly engage and not bind every time we move to the next drum over. So. Uh, I'm going to do the tedious task of that now and get this back to where, where it's uh, reading where it's supposed to. And then hopefully at that point, I can get this thing installed back in the uh, the Speedo and give it one last test and maybe we won't be skipping teeth anymore. All right, I spun it to the appropriate uh, mileage. And uh, in case any of you are wondering, no, I did not actually spin this gear 30,000 times to get the, uh, uh, or even 3,000 times to get to the 50,000 mile mark that you saw, um, you're able to rotate these metal tabs and that brings an entire dial with it. So um, I only rotated these, I think two or three times, but I did go back and forth, full rotations each way multiple times and then full rotations back. So you happen to see it at 50,000, but again, I didn't rotate it several thousand times. I did rotate it probably several hundred times from this gear uh, to make sure it traveled freely. So, um, I have now uh, seated these tabs back in between the bars like they're supposed to go, which holds it in place, and I'm going to put these two screws back in, uh, and then I'm going to just double check that the mileage is reading what it's supposed to, and then I will spin this bad boy and see if we still have the tooth jumping issue. Success! As you can see, after just a minute with the drill, not only was the uh, the needle climbing, uh, climbing, which I would normally show you, but I don't have enough hands to do that, uh, but you can see that the mileage has progressed forward. So before it was uh, 89.473.9, and it was right at transitioning, uh, rolling over to um, uh, 89.474, and that's where it got stuck. Well, now we're at 89.474, and right in between one and two miles. So uh, this is good. It didn't jump teeth. It is moving. So I just need to put this thing back together, I guess. All right, so the screws are already done up. Uh, and as a reminder, uh, it's the two upside down ones that are here, which we didn't end up needing really. Uh, it's the two right here that are pinning the assembly to the back of the gauge face and the two right here that are holding the odometer in. None of these need to be exceptionally tight. Again, uh, this is just pinning things in place. So you really don't need to crank them down. All right, so before it goes all back together, remember these lenses. Uh, so upon closer inspection, these are actually plastic, not glass, um, which makes cleaning them something I need to be careful with. Um, they do intentionally have this sort of matte finish to them. Um, and because of that, I'm hesitant to use any sort of cleaners on them. I feel like that risks uh, possibly making them turn like white and powdery or cloudy or even breaking. 
so I think I'm just going to wipe them with a soft, dry cloth, try and get any of that dirt off of them, and I think that'll at least be a mild improvement over what they were. Uh, you know, they always did the job, right? So I don't need to really go super fancy with these. Uh, so yeah, just a consideration, but I uh, might as well clean it while it's out of the car. For some reason, my gut told me that it would probably make more sense to drop these assemblies into the face before putting the cup on the back of this thing. So I've dropped the lens down in there, uh, and then I've inserted these cardboard tube thingies back where they were, uh, and obviously they had these little rubber boots on them. I've tried to like kind of lift the rubber boots up slightly so that when the cup drops down on top of this, it'll kind of press them into place at whatever depth they need to be as to whether that works or not. I don't know, but it just, for some reason in my head, it made sense to do it this way as gravity be working in my favor. Now, as far as uh, cleaning this thing goes, uh, I'm not going to, honestly. You can already see that the paint is starting to flake there, and I feel like if I tried to do anything to clean this, it's just going to flake off. And again, I just don't know enough about this paint to really comfortably, you know, try and uh, clean it or respray it or anything like that. So literally all I did was go and blow any loose dirt out of it and call it a day. So this goes back on top like so, and I'm just going to carefully see about lining up where the bulbs go, kind of like that. So I put the little rubber boots in and drop the screws through, and it's kind of neat. Even though this cup is actually sitting on the cloth and the gauge didn't quite reach up naturally to do it, the threads on these screws were long enough to get started in the back of it. So essentially, by me tightening these down, it's actually drawing the face up into the housing, which I'm just working back and forth between these two carefully, but it also lets me monitor the alignment of these housings as I go, so I can go real nice and steady and make sure everything lines up. So I'm gonna just work back and forth between these and that'll pull the face up into the cup while I'm watching how these are seated. Fancy. All right, now those two screws are nipped up. Again, I didn't crank them down because they are in rubber. I just made sure that they were kind of firmly seated. Uh, we're now going to place this back into the uh, face and surround. Uh, and you have these alignment tabs. So right up at the top here, you see those two little teeth and that little tab there. And then at the bottom here, we have the tab that I actually bent flat uh, to allow me access at this bottom corner here. Um, so basically, I'm gonna just make sure that this thing is in the correct way around, which obviously it is, and then I'm hoping that I can just press it back into place, but worst case, I might have to just do a reverse of what you saw me do before and kind of pry these sides out just to let them kind of slip up and over this lip. All right, we're getting there. So that went on pretty easy. Uh, it was definitely easier putting it back on than it was taking it off, uh, especially once I understood how it all worked. So it was kind of exactly what I talked about, which was basically, um, I kind of started at the top. I was able to tuck most of the clips under without having to really do much. And then um, I actually worked my way around here and it was these two that ended up, uh, I just had to kind of get the flat blade in there and just pry a little bit just to let them kind of uh, poke out and then clip up past. Um, you do not have to bend this tab down uh, at the end of the day, as long as you can get a, s a screwdriver in just over here, you'll be fine. Um, so I bent this back into place. Uh, so you can skip that step if, unless it's necessary for you to get access there to kind of start the process. Um, but yeah, so this is ready to go back into the main housing. I think it's ready to go back in the car. All right, so got the alignment grooves right there, there, and there. Okay, for some reason she's saying no. Maybe like that. Aha, there we go. All right, so you can see the alignment notch is there, there, and there are seated, and uh, we just have to get the screws back in. All right, we are back in business. Now we just gotta put the thing back in the car. So I have bench tested the speedometer. Uh, we've made that as a separate video and we're posting that just to our Patreon, uh, just some extra content. So if you guys haven't checked it out, do go over to the Patreon and see. It's kind of cool getting to see it being bench tested before it goes into the car. And it's just one of the little extra perks you get if you decide to support us over there as well. So um, if you aren't ready to go to the Patreon level yet, you can always consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already. Uh, we always appreciate that level of support as well. Everything really helps. So thank you guys and uh, keep on watching to see it go back in the car and see if it works. 
Now, if you've gone through your speedometer and know that it's functioning properly, uh, and that's not the issue, uh, then the next most likely thing, in fact, probably the most likely thing for you, is that the cable is bad or just needs lubricated. Um, so I'm going to show you as we get out to the car, um, I've actually already pulled the internal uh, cable itself out of my, uh, my speedo cable. Um, and I'm going to kind of show you how to lubricate it uh, and then put it back in. So, um, you know, we'll walk through that process as well. And honestly, it's more likely that the cable is your issue uh, than the speedo. Um, mine just happened to be, you know, the odometer getting stuck. So um, if you've checked your speedo, it's all functioning properly. Uh, when you turn the input shaft, everything moves as it should and it's not binding up, then the cable is quite likely the issue. And we're back in the car. It is remarkable how much barn dust made its way into every nook and cranny of this car. But every time I take something apart, it gives me an opportunity to get it clean, get more of the mung out. I was complaining about how dull the uh, instrument cluster lights were, but I realized, look how dirty that is. I just gave that one a quick wipe with a, a moist paper towel, and yeah, I think a, a quick wipe down, that'll at least increase the brightness, um, uh, especially when compounded with uh, cleaning the lens the way I did as well. So, fingers crossed, we'll, uh, we'll get a little more brightness once I wipe those down too. All right, so, now I've done some of the uh, the simple cleaning. So this is where the speedo cable actually runs through. And when I first took the cable out, I actually uh, took the time after disconnecting the bottom end as well, very important, and making sure to point it away from anything. Um, I blasted some uh, brake parts cleaner down the middle of it just to flush out any dirt. And a bunch of mung came out, it was uh, pretty gross. But the inside of that is now relatively clean and has ample has had ample time to, to dry out. Uh, brake parts cleaner dries quickly anyway, but you know, it's, um, it's important to note that I did clean the inside of that. Uh, so now we're going to lubricate the cable itself and put it back in. So this is our Speedo cable. Um, I have kind of visually inspected it just to make sure there's no like frayed or obviously physically damaged parts. And uh, frankly, the cable actually looks perfect. Um, I basically just wiped it down with a uh, dry paper towel uh, and there was a bunch of like loose kind of, you know, dust on it. Um, there's a chance it might've been the original like graphite lubricant um, that is uh, one of the two options to use to lubricate these cables. And um, there's a good chance that was what it was, as well as just some general dirt and, uh, you know, powderized metal probably from operating for so many years. Um, so again, the uh, visual inspection is important because if yours looks damaged, you probably do need to replace the cable itself, but mine does not. Mine definitely still looks serviceable. So uh, we're basically just gonna lubricate this and uh, get it reinstalled. So you can see the two ends of the cable here. Uh, you have one that is just a straight shot like this, and then another one that has a kind of a cap or a stop on it. So it's important to note that the one with the stop is the one that goes on the top of the cable. Basically, this is the side that goes into the back of the speedometer. Um, so you're actually going to start by threading this end down the, uh, the outer sleeve of the cable, uh, and then this end should remain up inside the car. Mine has this little uh, washer as well. Uh, however, the replacement cable I bought, which I've ended up not needing, uh, did not have a washer, it just had the stop. So yours may or may not have that. So there's always the age old discussion of lubricants. And from what I've researched, it looks like there's two main types that should be able to do the trick. Uh, the two main ones are going to be either a graphite lubricant, like I just mentioned, uh, which you can now get convenient ones in a spray can that basically have a carrier, uh, which will evaporate just leaving the uh, graphite itself. That's supposed to be an excellent choice from what I've read. Um, I just simply don't have that, uh, nor have I had the time to run and get some. Uh, but uh, if, you're able, if you're going to be buying lubricant just for this, that's probably the way to go. Um, from what I understand, a perfectly acceptable one is also uh, white lithium grease, which I do happen to have. It should be noted, though, um, some people have said that white lithium grease is not the best choice if you live up north uh, where it gets cold because it can kind of thicken up uh, and perhaps impede the operation of the Speedo. So for me living in Florida... It's not really an issue, so white lithium grease should be perfectly fine. Uh, if you're unsure, just err on the side of caution and probably go with the graphite lubricant. There may be a better way of doing this, but I am uh, basically just going to hold it kind of coiled like this and try and give the thing just a good coating of the white lithium grease. And then as I feed it in, I'll use my hand to distribute it onto any spots that may have been missed. So, uh, you know, I figure uh, there might be a more methodical way, but I'm gonna go for the, uh, the nuclear option. Lovely. So I'm definitely gonna need both hands to do this without making a giant mess, so I will film after it's in.
Well, that was predictably messy, but I have now cleaned my hands thoroughly with soapy water, and um, thankfully this stuff comes off pretty easy. So uh, let me flip the thing around and show you what we were working with. So as I mentioned, I basically fed the uh, the cable in there, and uh, I just tried, did my best to kind of keep the, uh, the grease off of any of the components, you know, the dashboard and all that stuff. Um, so I've read that it's best to try and clean the end here where it does go into the uh, the Speedo and make sure you don't have a ton of excess in the little cup back there. Um, you just don't want it to kind of, you know, squish into the, the Speedo assembly itself because it uses a different kind of lubricant, right? So I've done my best to kind of give that a little simple wipe out to where it shouldn't really be too much of an issue. And then importantly, I have given it a test. Let me see if I can do this where you can see it, but it rotates extremely nice and freely. So, um, you know, Essentially, uh, yeah, of course the angle I'm holding at is weird, but uh, it does rotate freely. There's no binding, there's no weirdness. Um, so with very little effort, that is just spinning in there. Um, so I think we're ready to go. Uh, essentially, it's time to just put the Speedo back in. All right, I have all of the uh, illumination bulbs connected back in. Uh, I decided to do these first because they have slack on the harness, whereas the Speedo cable does not. So I'm gonna actually have to now put the gauge cluster back in before inserting and threading that from underneath the dash. Installation is the reverse of the removal. There we go. So I put the uh, two screws in just to hold the cluster in place so that now when I go under the dash, it doesn't move around like crazy. Um, and that way, when I put the nut back on, as well as threading the speedo cable back in, it should make things a little bit easier. All right, the cluster is officially back in place. Uh, the nut that holds the stud back here is now back on properly. So we are firmly bolted back onto the dash and I have reattached the speedo cable. It's pretty self-explanatory, but again, the square end of the cable itself slots into the back of the speedo, as you saw where the little drive unit is, and then there's the outer cup, which threads on to the back of the speedo. Um, once that's done, uh, it's basically ready to go at the top end. There's nothing else needed here. So now we need to lift the car up and go underneath and attach the bottom end to the transmission. One of the perks of air ride. All right, and as you can see, the cable is attached here at the side of the end of the uh, tail shaft of the trans. Yours may look a little different. Mine is a 204R, um, but you know you could have a power glide or even a stick shift uh, trans would have a similar concept. Basically, there would be a port on the side. You'll see a square peg that the uh, speedo cable goes into, and then you just thread it on. Basically the same as the back of the Speedo itself, just a little bit bigger. Things are riding like a monster truck right now, but that's how I was able to get underneath it without needing a jack. All right, after a quick change, uh, as I didn't want to get my soaking wet t-shirt and jeans in the car, uh, we're going to take this thing on a test drive and see if the Speedo works. Happy ugga dugga noises, I love it. a success. Uh, the speedo seems to be working and the speed seems to be reading correctly. Um, I was just following traffic there and uh, this is a 35 mile an hour street so we were fluctuating it looked like between 35 and 40 there. Um, so yeah I think that's a win. Well, I'm gonna call that a win. Speedo works, odometer works, no weird noises. Uh, I was able to reuse the original cable, which was fantastic. It just needed a lubricating. 
um, everything was real straightforward. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I did uh, have a bit of an adventure there diving in and figuring out how these speedos work. Uh, and hopefully that was helpful to you. I know these things can be daunting sometimes if you don't know exactly what's going on. Um, but as you can see, all these things are in the end relatively straightforward once you know what does what and how it all goes together and how it all interacts, right? So um, if this video was helpful for you, please do uh, like and subscribe. We really appreciate it. Uh, hopefully this was some fun content. I always love working on the Chevy. Um, and of course, uh, you know, again, I know I casually say please like and subscribe, but each subscriber really does help us grow the channel. And, um, you know, I think if you like this, there's a good chance you're going to like a lot more of our future content as well. So staying subscribed really does help you stay on top of it when we release new videos. So thank you for watching and uh, we'll catch you on the next one.